I think our leader, Trudeau, I don't think I've ever heard him say a true word. Hello and welcome to a bonus episode of Off Script, where I sit down with Dr. Jordan Peterson to discuss his home country, Canada. Let's put Canada on the psychiatrist's table. Let's diagnose Canadian society. Is it delusional? Is it paranoid? Is it stable? What is it? Blind, manipulated, led by, I think our leader, Trudeau, I don't think I've ever heard him say a true word. You know, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic in that regard. I've met people in my clinical practice and otherwise who were temperamentally incapable of any gesture or any word that was actually genuine. And that's a consequence of long practice. I think he's at least narcissistic, at minimum. And I think he's enabled by the useful idiots of the liberal left. And I actually think that's a very widespread problem and probably more typical of Canada now than any other developed country, much to our chagrin. So there's a developing body of research on left-wing authoritarianism. Now the social psychologists, who are a pretty woke bunch, denied that left-wing authoritarianism existed from the end of World War II until 2016. And when the first work on left-wing authoritarianism came out. Now, the way you study something like political belief is you take a large corpus of questions about political attitude, several hundred, let's say, and you subject them to a statistical analysis that tells you how they sort. And so imagine you're likely to agree with one question, then you're more likely to agree with another related question. If you disagree with the question, you're, there'll be related questions that you're likely to disagree with. Uh, a sophisticated computer program, it's kind of a primitive AI system, by the way, can sort those questions, and then you can tell if there's a clump of them. And at the time, 2016, the idea that there was such a thing as a politically correct corpus of beliefs was derided as a right-wing conspiracy, so we decided to test that. And it was clear that you could identify a group of beliefs that were progressive, let's say, but then you could identify a variant of that that combined hypothetically progressive goals with authoritarianism, which was really the willingness to use fear and power and compulsion to force. So then there's an there's an alliance, let's say, between compassion and force. And that makes you a left-wing authoritarian. Now, we looked at what predicted whether or not you would be a left-wing authoritarian. And we found that the biggest predictor was low verbal intelligence. Right, and it was a walloping predictor. It was more associated with left-wing authoritarianism than it was with academic performance. And those are basically the same thing, right? General cognitive ability and academic performance. So to find a relationship that was even more powerful was quite the shock. So when you ask yourself, how can people be clueless enough to buy the politically correct line? The answer is, well, they're not very sophisticated verbally. And so if you offer them a solution that's a one-stop fits-all solution, it's all power, then they buy that because it's a comprehensive explanation for the world. There's a self-serving aspect to it, and they have no capacity for critical thought. The second best predictor was being female. The third best predictor was having a feminine temperament, independent of whether you were male or female. And the next best predictor was having ever taken a course that was explicitly politically correct in its aims. So, we were well on the way to publishing that, although that's when my career blew up, and it only ended up being produced in a master's degree format. But since then, there's been a lot of additional work done on left-wing authoritarianism. And so, people have been looking at the relationship between left-wing authoritarianism and something called the dark first triad and then tetrad. Okay, so in British Columbia, there was a professor named Robert Hare. And Hare studied criminal psychopaths. He was really the first person to define psychopathy psychometrically. Pred predatory parasite is what a psychopath is. Someone who will take what you have and will live off you if they can. That's a predatory parasite. And he studied 
the serious ones, the ones that were in prison, and hundreds of them. And then his students started to study subclinical psychopathy, so the same traits at a lower level in the general population. And there are different disciplines and industries that attract people with a more psychopathic bent. Media, politics, entertainment, um, medicine, possibly, especially surgery, we'll get back to that. And they found that subclinical psychopathy manifested itself in three manners. Narcissism, so that's the desire for unearned social status, right, and, and the desire for constant attention. Machiavellianism, so if you're talking to a Machiavellian, all he's ever trying to figure out is what he can get from you and will craft his words accordingly, right, use words instrumentally. And psychopathy, which we already touched on. And then, as a consequence of further analysis, the researchers ended up adding sadism to that, because th those three weren't bad enough. And so sadism is positive delight in the suffering of others. And uh, lulls culture online, LOL culture, lulls culture, that's a manifestation of sadism. Right? And we know too, the researchers who have been investigating this area have shown that the real online troll demon types are very high in the dark tetrad traits, so they're enabled online. Anyways, the relationship between dark tetrad personality traits and left-wing authoritarianism is so high that they're probably indistinguishable on the measurement front. And so what that means is that all this nonsense about compassion is the manipulations of snakes pulling in the useful idiots, who perhaps are genuinely compassionate, to, uh, what would you say, to further their unbelievably narrowly self-centered and destructive agenda. And that's Canada, in a nutshell. And Canadians are shocked by this, you know, because they're shocked into disbelief, I would say, because for 175 years or thereabouts, well, let's say since, since Confederation, we won't go back any farther than that, was 1867, 150 years, our institutions were reliable, derived as they were from Great Britain, which produced reliable institutions for all sorts of miraculous reasons. You could trust the political parties, the Socialists were a Labour Party, the Conservatives were a party of big business, the Liberals kind of played both ends against the middle and were centrists and they were usually in power and all things considered that didn't work out too badly. You know, when we got tired of them we could elect the Conservatives, which happened now and then federally, or the Socialists or the Conservatives, which happened fairly regularly provincially, and the whole damn country functioned well. The education system worked, the higher education systems were you know, we don't have Harvard or Stanford, but all our universities were pretty damn good. Um, no duds in the lot, really. Um, Canada was a very stable, middle-class country with reliable institutions. And, and the media as well. Even CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, when I grew up, it was fundamentally trustworthy. Probably tilted somewhat to the left, insofar as things were tilted towards the left, say, in the 70s and so on. But... You could, you could assume that the journalists at CBC were journalists, not propagandists. And it was the same with, we had CTV, which was the main private competitor. And the same thing obtained there. And that's all. To say that's gone is to say almost nothing. Canadians have no idea what to do with that. Well, let's talk about what's happened to Canadian society, Canadian identity, and this reworking of the idea of what Canada is as a country, and particularly when you look at its history and its links with its colonial past, Trudeau and others are very much trying to detach Canada from that colonial British history and that British sense of identity, I suppose. Yeah, that's, that's what he says he's doing. You see, see, the thing about him and his minions is I don't trust them at all. I think that what Trudeau is doing is testing his fingers in the wind constantly to see where the easiest moral advantage can be obtained and then driving down that direction as fast as he possibly can. I don't believe for a second that he has any such thing as principles. It doesn't look because I don't think anybody who lies with every single word and gesture ever has principles. And I know, for example, this was definitely true during the pandemic. And this was true not only of the Liberals, Trudeau's party, but also of the Conservatives and the Socialists, is that um, during the pandemic, all our politicians did nothing but sample um, opinion poll constantly and then derive policy as a consequence of sampling the very people that they frightened with their propagandistic idiocy and then produce policy and then pretend as an outright complete bloody lie that it was the science leading it. And that's how Trudeau governs in relationship to everything. He looks for the easiest moral advantage. We're saving the planet. It's like, yeah, I don't think so, buddy. 
It's not an easy thing to do to save the planet. And what are we going to do? We're going to go down Germany, the route of Germany, where electricity is now unreliable, super expensive, and 10 times as polluting in terms of carbon output per unit of electricity than France. That'll be Canada's destiny. We're slaughtering our fossil fuel industry, which basically means we're just handing it over to the Chinese, you know, the whole fossil fuel enterprise. I'm sure they're just laughing up their sleeves at our complete bloody idiocy. Yeah. So, you know, hypothetically Trudeau is trying to tip us away from our colonial past, but I don't believe any of this is political. I think that he is, he's a narcissistic dark tetrad type, and he'll use whatever machinations, him and Stephen Guilbeau, that bloody minister, hypothetically responsible for, for energy and the environment, to the degree they overlap. He's such a bloody poser. And so, it, Canadians have no idea what Trudeau is and don't want to know. So it seems that what's unique to Canada in a way is Trudeau himself as a leader compared to other Western nations because you could look at the COVID lockdowns or wokeism or whatever and they, they apply to lots of Western countries, yeah. to most Western countries. And, but what I'm interested in, I suppose, is what is it about Canada itself mm -hmm. that Canada has gone so far to the left? And maybe you disagree that Canada is an outlier compared to other Western nations. You can explain No, that. I think we've, we've gone further down the woke road than, you know, any other place except perhaps for California. Uh, I think part of the reason for that is that we were an early adopter of the doctrines of group rights. So back in the 1980s, Canada has almost split apart twice in recent years, and very, very close. There were two referenda, and both of them, to call the results marginal is to say almost nothing. It was fractions of a percent that kept the country together. And in the 1980s, uh, Trudeau's father, who was also quite the piece of work, repatriated, so to speak, our constitution. And I suppose that was in part because the French, the Francophones, so to speak, weren't very happy that we were still, in some ways, governed by Great Britain. Although, as far as I'm concerned, that was a perfectly good deal, especially compared to the alternative. And so we tried to bring the constitution back and, and did so and produced a new charter of rights and a new constitution and bent ourselves into knots trying to get Quebec to sign and in doing so weaken the structural foundations of the constitution and the charter of rights to a degree that really i think makes them not worth the paper they're written on and in a failed attempt to actually bring quebec back into the fold but in doing so we also agreed that groups had rights the francophones had rights the indigenous people as as a group had rights the anglophones had rights there were three founding peoples and group and individual rights had to be balanced and I don't think there is any such thing as group rights because there's no such thing as group responsibility so that's a it's a non-starter conceptually and so the the in some ways the table was set in Canada for the rise of a more universal doctrine of group identity and group rights and plus Canadians pride themselves on you know being nice let's say and you know, and not being offensive and just hoping that everyone will get along. And, you know, there's nothing glorious about incivility, but there's very little to distinguish excessive niceness from weakness. And the problem with being nice, and this is a technical problem because niceness is associated with trait agreeableness, is that agreeable people are cannon fodder for psychopaths. And biologists have modeled this. So, for example, if you put together automated communities of reciprocal cooperative traders they do very well you know the the whole pot expands but if you throw one psychopath into the mix he takes everything and the reason for that is that if you're too agreeable the dark tetrad types the predatory parasites they'll take you out and they'll use your compassion as a weapon against you i mean we know that the the people who suffer from the psychopathologies or manifest the psychopathologies that are associated with quasi psychopathic traits are very much prone to using victimization as a weapon so i don't believe that any of the conundrum that we're in at the moment in the west is strictly political i think what's happened is that the the predatory psychopaths have figured out how to cloak themselves in the guise of compassion and their machinations are enabled online. And this is dangerous beyond belief. So sex itself, by the way, sex itself evolved 
to deal with the problem of parasitism. So that's how deep the problem of parasitism is. Now about 3% of human beings have a parasitical bent. They would be high in extroversion, low in agreeableness, low in conscientiousness. And there's a niche for psychopaths. And the niche is, especially for psychopathic men, is psychopathic men mimic confidence. So they look competent. And they can fool young women. And that's how they propagate themselves. But in, generally speaking, the psychopaths never increase in number beyond about 3 to 5% of the population, stable cross-culturally. So if the psychopath prevalence falls to 1%, everybody forgets about them, everybody starts being nice, and then the psychopaths can start to flourish. But once they get up to about 5%, everybody thinks, uh-oh, the snakes have come back, and they start to beat them back, and so it stabilizes at about 3%. So there's a niche there, an evolutionary niche. Now, the danger in that is that now and then the psychopaths get the upper hand. That's what happened in the Russian Revolution, for example. A very small percentage of the population who come together and are then, for one reason or another, enabled in a manner that enables them to circumvent our normal evolutionary evolutionarily prepared responses to psychopathic predation, they can take down the whole society. And the problem we have, this is a deadly serious problem, is that there is no punishment for psychopaths online. They can do whatever the hell they want. And, and this could easily take us out. 35% of net traffic is pornography. And then how much of it do you think is outright criminality? I don't know an old person in Canada I think this is true across the West, who hasn't been targeted by online criminals. They have databases on everyone old. They know where their bank accounts are. They're targeted constantly. And so there's immense criminal activity on the web, international in scope, including child slavery, uh, trade, and all that sort of, you know, absolute bloody atrocity. And then there's the subclinical troll types who do nothing but cause trouble and raise havoc while they're enabled by the idiot social media companies who allow them their what would you say, their scot-free psychopathic anonymity. And this is not good. It's seriously not good. One other area where Canada perhaps shows itself to be unique in the West in terms of issues of morality are these new laws around assisted dying, what they call euphemistically made. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Orwell spinning in his grave. Absolutely. And there's some very insane cases that we've interviewed for this documentary actually uh, in terms of people being offered made and things like this so do you think that in a christian nation this would happen and has canada become the first real post-christian nation well we're not as post-christian as you can get but yes i would say in the west are we the first one we're certainly in the, we're in the front runners, and no, I don't think it would happen in a truly Christian society. And I think Christianity and, 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 and Judaism, for that matter, and in all likelihood Islam, is actually a bulwark against such things. Because at least you start with the metaphysical presumption, at least in the Judeo-Christian uh, corpus, that there's some, you know, each person carries with them a spark of the divine, that the state has no right to interfere with in the least quite the contrary must be respectful of continually and and independent of that i also think that if you're the sort of fool who thinks that the government should have the power to aid people in their own death well you've got a lot of thinking to do buddy because why would you presume that the government is trustworthy enough to do that i'm an opponent of capital punishment not because i don't think there are crimes that are sufficiently heinous to deserve death because there certainly are and if you don't know that you don't know anything about crime that's for sure there's lots of serial sexual killers who begged for the death penalty because they couldn't even bear the weight of their own conscience so even in, by their own judgment they didn't deserve to live but i don't think the state should ever have that power and then now we're giving the state that power well on compassionate grounds so we spoke to a clinician who is involved in the maid process who's very much in favor of this assisted dying yeah. before uh, the maid laws were passed she works in an abortion clinic hmm, surprise and surprise she said that some of the maid um, some of the deaths that she aids there are priests present who are involved in these ceremonies does that surprise you no 
Didn't the arch, was it the Archbishop of Canterbury this week who decided that uh, referring to God the Father was part of the process of patriarchal oppression and criticized the Lord's Prayer? What Archbishop they, of York, I think it was. Arch, yes, that's right, the Archbishop of York. And I've been to the UK. There's pride flags in every church. So, and in Canada, the United Church was the main Protestant denomination. It was taken over by half-wit atheist radicals 30 years ago, and they just ran it into the ground, which was exactly the point. So, no, it's not surprising at all. There's no shortage of so-called progressive Christians, even though you can't, you can't be a progressive Christian any more than you can be a woke capitalist. It's complete bloody nonsense. You know, and that doesn't mean that, I mean, Christianity, that the notion of sovereignty in Christianity is that the highest should serve the truly distressed and the lowest. And I think that that's a revolutionary idea and one of the cardinal ideas of all time. And of course, that's associated with a certain compassion, but it's a compassion that also requires judiciousness and, and a focus on the individual. And so, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, or does it? I don't know whether I'm never surprised or constantly amazed at the moment because, you know, every day there's something stupider than there was the last day, and that's a very hard contest to win at the moment. One of the major issues, obviously, across the Western world that uh, governments are trying to fight is climate change. And yeah, climate change. And different governments the are using... The progressive get-out-of-jail-free card. Well, in the UK, we've got this thing called net zero. Yes, I presume, I'm well aware of presume net presume you have zero. the same thing. Net, net zero means zero for the peasants. That's so what's, what it means. What's going on in Canada? Well, here's a cardinal example. I mean, first of all, we have a province in Canada, Alberta, which has the third largest fossil fuel reserves in the world, and we're very good at utilizing them, let's say. Um, they're rather dirty in some ways on the environmental front, but um, that's life, you might say. And um, our country, and certainly that province, could be rich at the level of Norway with any degree of reasonable management whatsoever, and I think that's true for the whole country. Quebec itself has enough natural gas to provision itself for 200 years, and they won't touch it for reasons that are so diluted that it, it defies comprehension. The Chancellor of Germany, who was a socialist, and that's relevant given that hypothetically he's in Trudeau's camp, came to Canada less than a year ago, cap in hand, because the Germans were desperate, because they've been following idiot green policies for far too long, and Trudeau said, well, we can't make a business case for shipping you liquid natural gas. Well, and the reason for that is he made it impossible for anybody to make a business case to do that, even though the Germans were prepared to offer tens of billions of dollars to us with on unbelievably favorable terms that were very long-term in scope. And so we turned away one of our greatest allies in the West, left them in the hands of the bloody Russians and the Qataris so that our idiot prime minister could virtue signal pointlessly about destroying the fossil fuel industry in a manner that will make Canada poor and help the world not one bit. Right, and then the Prime Minister of Japan came and asked for the same thing and got exactly the same treatment. And so, now Alberta is landlocked, unfortunately, and it's next to a province, the province British Columbia, and British Columbia is a coastal province, and it tends to be woke and socialist, partly because it has Vancouver attached to it, um, and so Alberta can't get its fossil fuel resources out through, out to the world on the west coast. And so that's a complete bloody catastrophe. And the new premier there, Danielle Smith, she's going to end up essentially going to war with Trudeau. It's enough to break up the whole damn country as far as I'm concerned. And there's a, there's an, uh, what, an irritable part of me that thinks that would be for the best. So what we're doing in Canada on the energy front is utterly insane. It's utterly insane. And, and why do I say that? Well, I say that in li not least because I saw what happened to Germany. If the Greens would have managed to increase the price of electricity, but maintain its reliability and cut the pollution associated with its production, that would be one thing. But what they did instead was make it so expensive that even electric battery manufacturers can no longer afford to operate in Germany. They made it utterly unreliable. They killed off their nuclear industry, which was, to call that insane, is to barely scrape the surface. They made it much more expensive, and it's way more polluting than it used to be, because now they rely on burning lignite. So, how in the world, unless you're aiming at disruption, which I do believe is what the psychopaths on the green side are aiming at, by the way, unless you're aiming at disruption and impoverishment and mass misery, every single bit of that reeks of failure by the criteria of the people who put the policies in place. 
And we're running down that road as fast as we can in Canada so that Trudeau can pretend that he is what? A paragon of moral virtue and keep up his, his grip on whatever the hell he regards as power. If you enjoyed this interview with Dr. Peterson, then check out the trailer for our documentary on Canada, A Warning to the West. Canada. Under Justin Trudeau, the former British colony has sought to position itself as the global bastion of progressive politics. We have become a totalitarian state. As his cultural revolution shows no sign of abating, I went to Canada to find out how ordinary Canadians are dealing with Trudeau's radical reforms. The sexualization has become militarized. From the promotion of gender ideology. What the f is that? Do you want to talk about it? To the legalization of drugs. Overdoses are up. Violent crime is up. It's, it's, it's a jungle. Radical new suicide laws. Do you think that they want you dead? Yes. I, I think it's wrong. And clampdowns on freedom of speech. I think our leader, Trudeau, I don't think I've ever heard him say a true word. All this nonsense about compassion is the manipulations of snakes pulling in the useful idiots who perhaps are genuinely compassionate, and that's Canada. 